long before William Harvey discovered blood circulation, it was believed that good health was a result of the balance of certain humors like black bile, yellow bile, phlegm and blood inside the body. Further, persons with black bile were supposed to have a hot personality and fevers. This hypothesis had to be disregarded when it was realized that even people with black bile and blood circulating inside their body had normal body temperature Health then came to be regarded as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being. However, when our body is infected with a disease, we are no longer healthy. Diseases can be of two types, infectious and non-infectious. As the name suggests, infectious diseases are those that can be transmitted from one person to another. While some infectious diseases such as the flu are very common, others like AIDS are fatal. Diseases can be caused by a variety of organisms such as bacteria or fungi. All disease causing organisms are called pathogens. By that definition, all parasites are pathogens since they harm their host by living off them. Pathogens enter our body through various means, adapt to the environment inside the body and multiply inside. They then interfere with normal bodily functions, causing either morphological or functional damage. Some common pathogens are bacteria, viruses, helminths and fungi. The bacteria Salmonella typhi causes typhoid fever in humans. Usually these bacteria enter the small intestine via contaminated food or water and migrate to other organs via the blood. Did you know that Typhoid Mary is a classic case in medicine where a professional cook called Mary Mallon caused several typhoid outbreaks through the food she prepared? This happened because Mary Mallon was a healthy typhoid carrier herself. She did not display any common symptoms of typhoid like high fever, weakness, stomach pain, constipation, headache and loss of appetite. Typhoid fever can be confirmed by a Weddell test. In extreme cases, typhoid can cause intestinal perforation and death. Other bacteria like Streptococcus, Pneumoniae and Haemophilus influenzae cause pneumonia that infects the alveoli of the human lungs. As a result of the infection, the air-filled alveoli sacs are filled with fluid and this causes respiratory problems. Fever, chills, cough and headache are other symptoms of pneumonia. Sometimes in severe cases, the lips and fingernails turn grey to blue in colour. Pneumonia is so contagious that merely sharing glasses and utensils or inhaling droplets released by an infected person can spread the infection. That merely sharing glasses and utensils or inhaling droplets released by an infected person can spread the infection or inhaling droplets released by an infected person can spread the infection.
dysentery, plague and diphtheria are other diseases caused by bacteria. Viruses are not behind when it comes to causing infectious diseases. Rhinoviruses are responsible for causing the common cold. Did you know that the common cold is one of the most commonly infected human diseases? Unlike pneumonia, it infects only the nose and respiratory passage instead of the lungs. Nasal congestion and discharge, a sore throat, headache and hoarseness are other symptoms of the common cold, which lasts for about three to seven days. During this time, the disease can spread by inhaling droplets from a cough or sneeze of an infected person or through contaminated articles of the infected person. Such as pens, books, doorknobs, computer keyboards and other similar objects. Helminths like Ascaris and Wuchereria are also responsible for causing pathogenic diseases in human beings. Ascaris, the common roundworm, is an intestinal parasite that causes ascariasis. It is characterized by internal bleeding, muscular pain, fever, anemia and blockage of the intestinal passage. Since eggs of the parasite are also excreted along with the feces of human beings, soil, water and plants are also infected. The infection spreads to a healthy person through contaminated food, vegetables and fruits. Wuchereria bancrofti is a filarial worm that causes a disease called elephantiasis or filariasis. Filariasis is characterized by chronic inflammation of the organs. The filarial worm occupies the lymphatic system, usually in the lower organs such as the legs, where they continue to live for years. The genital organs are often affected, resulting in gross deformities. Filariasis can be transmitted to healthy people by female mosquito vectors. A vector is an insect or any living carrier, such as female mosquitoes in the case of filariasis, that transmit infectious diseases. Other pathogens such as fungi like Microsporum, Trichophyton and Epidermophyton cause ringworm that appears as dry scaly lesions on various parts of the body such as the skin, nails and scalp. These lesions also cause intense itching. They thrive in skin folds like the groin or between the toes as fungi thrive in heat and moisture. Ringworms can be transmitted to healthy individuals by sharing towels, combs and clothes of an infected person. Therefore, pathogens like bacteria, viruses and helminths are responsible for causing some common yet extremely infectious diseases. Of the many infectious diseases that exist across the globe, one that afflicts 40% of the world's population is malaria. According to the World Health Organization or WHO, malaria kills a child every 30 seconds. Worldwide, 
it is estimated that there are 300 to 500 million clinical cases of malaria a year. Did you know that malaria is caused by a tiny parasitic protozoan called Plasmodium? P. vivax, P. malaria and P. falciparum are different species of parasitic protozoa that are responsible for different types of malaria. Of these, P. falciparum causes the most serious and fatal type of malaria. Plasmodium enters the human body in its infectious form, known as sporozoites, through the bite of the female Anopheles mosquito. Sporozoites travel through the blood to reach the liver, where they initially multiply via asexual reproduction to form merozoites inside the liver cell. The liver cells burst and the merozoites are released into the blood. Then, they attack the red blood cells or RBCs by multiplying again via asexual reproduction and leading to the rupture of RBCs. The rupture of RBCs releases a toxic substance called hemozoin which causes chills and high fevers every three to four days. As the released parasites go on to infect new RBCs, some merozoites develop into sexually differentiated forms such as male and female gametocytes. So when the female Anopheles mosquito bites an infected person, these male and female gametocytes enter the mosquito's body. They further fertilize and develop inside the mosquito's intestine to form sporozoites. These sporozoites migrate from the intestine to the salivary glands of the mosquitoes where they are then stored. Later, when these mosquitoes bite healthy individuals, the sporozoites are introduced into the human body, repeating the same chain of events. You may notice that the malarial parasite Plasmodium requires two hosts, human beings and mosquitoes, to complete its life cycle. The life cycle includes two phases, the asexual one in human beings and the sexual phase in the female Anopheles mosquito. Also, it is Plasmodium that is the cause of the malaria, while the female Anopheles mosquito merely acts as a vector or a transmitting agent. Apart from malaria, amoebiasis or amoebic dysentery is another disease caused by a protozoan called Entamoeba histolytica that lives in the large intestine of human beings. It is characterized by symptoms such as the discharge of blood and mucus in the feces, severe pain in the abdomen and constipation. Houseflies act as vectors by transmitting the parasite from the feces of the infected person to food and water. It is by consuming such contaminated food and water that the infection is transmitted. Therefore, maintaining both personal and public hygiene is crucial for the prevention and control of several infectious diseases such as the common cold, typhoid, polio and diphtheria. It is easy to take care of personal hygiene by keeping our body clean and consuming clean food and water. Public hygiene, however, requires proper disposal of waste and excreta, periodic cleaning and disinfection of water bodies like tanks, reservoirs and pools, and hygienic public catering services. Keeping water and food clean is important because most infectious diseases like typhoid, amoebiasis and ascariasis are spread by vectors that are transmitted through contaminated food and water. Further, it is important to control or eliminate vectors 
along with their breeding places. No water should be allowed to stagnate around residential areas. Even household coolers should be regularly cleaned. Insecticides or kerosene oil should be sprayed in ditches, drains and swamps. Some fish like Gambusia that feed on mosquito larvae should be bred in ponds and lakes. Doors and windows should be provided with a wire mesh to keep mosquitoes outside and at night mosquito nets and mosquito repellents should be used. Undertaking such control measures prevents the transmission of diseases such as malaria and filariasis which are transmitted by mosquito vectors. Even diseases like dengue and chikungunya which are transmitted by a mosquito vector called ADs can be avoided by implementing these control measures. For airborne diseases like pneumonia and the common cold, care must also be taken that contact with infected persons and their belongings are avoided. While some like smallpox have been eradicated completely, others such as polio, diphtheria, pneumonia and tetanus can be controlled to a large extent by vaccines. With new emerging developments in biotechnology, several antibiotics and drugs have been discovered that are effectively used in the treatment of infectious diseases. Therefore, though malaria and amoebiasis are caused by protozoans, they are transmitted by vector mosquitoes. However, with careful control measures, vaccination and drugs, these diseases can be dealt with. You may have noted that some people get sick more often than others. When an infectious disease is doing the rounds of your locality, there are some who remain healthy while others take ill too soon. Also, even though our body is attacked every day by several infectious agents, we do not succumb to every agent. Why is that? The answer lies in the immunity of our bodies, which varies from individual to individual. Immunity is the overall ability of a host to fight the disease-causing organisms. Immunity is of two types, innate and acquired. Innate immunity is something we all possess since birth. It is a non-specific kind of defense, which provides different types of barriers to the entry of foreign agents to our body. Four different types of barriers are provided by innate immunity. Physical barriers, physiological barriers, cellular barriers, and cytokine barriers. The skin on our body is the main physical barrier to the entry of microbes. The mucus coatings of the epithelial lining of the respiratory, gastrointestinal and urogenital tracts inside the body are also physical barriers to microbes as they trap them. Saliva in the mouth, hydrochloric acid inside the stomach, as well as tears in the eyes, act as physiological barriers to microbial invasion. Our body also has certain types of leukocytes or white blood cells or WBCs, such as monocytes, natural killer lymphocytes and polymorphonuclear leukocytes, also known as PMNL neutrophils, in the blood. Together, they constitute a cellular barrier along with macrophages in the tissues. They can also destroy microbes. Some virus-infected cells release proteins called interferons that prevent the spread of infection in the body, thereby acting as cytokine barriers in the body. On the other hand, 
Acquired immunity is pathogen specific. It depends on the body's memory. For example, when a body encounters a bacterium for the first time, it produces a low intensity response called a primary immune response and produces memory cells. However, when the same bacterium attacks again, the memory cells help to elicit a secondary immune response of high intensity. This response is also known as an anamnestic response. Both primary and secondary immune responses are made possible by two special lymphocytes in our blood. B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes respectively. B lymphocytes produce proteins to fight pathogens, whereas T lymphocytes help B cells to perform this task. The protective proteins produced by B cells are called antibodies. Each antibody molecule has four peptide chains, two small and two longer ones. The two small chains are called light chains, while the two longer ones are called heavy chains. Therefore, an antibody is represented by H2L2. IgA, IgM, IgE and IgG are some examples of antibodies in our body. Acquired immunity or the acquired immune response is primarily of two types. A humoral immune response and a cell mediated immunity or CMI. It is the humoral immune response that is carried out by antibodies. Since antibodies are found in blood, it is called the humoral immune response. The word humoral refers to blood or any other body fluid. The cell mediated immune response can be best understood with the example of an organ transplant. When organs like the eye, heart, kidney or liver fail, organ transplant is the only remedy. Thus begins the search for a suitable healthy donor for transplantation. This is important because grafts or transplants cannot be made from just about any source as the body will reject those grafts sooner or later. To find a perfect match, tissue matching and blood group matching are conducted before a transplant. This ability of the body to differentiate between self and non-self while rejecting grafts is the cell mediated immune response. It is an immune response that doesn't involve antibodies but it involves the activation of macrophages, natural killer cells or NK, antigen specific cytotoxic T lymphocytes and the release of various cytokines that fight antigens. Patients who have had organ transplants have to take immune suppressants all their lives to inhibit their body's immune response against the transplant. Then again, based on whether the antibodies are produced inside or outside the body, immunity can be distinguished as active immunity or passive immunity. When the body is exposed to antigens such as living or dead microbes or other proteins, it produces antibodies in response. This type of immunity is called active immunity, which is slow and takes time to reach its full effective response. When microbes gain access to the body during a natural infection, active immunity is induced. Consequently, the underlying principle of any immunization plan is active immunity. 
where it is induced by deliberately injecting microbes into the body. On the other hand, passive immunity comes into play when ready-made antibodies are delivered directly into the body from external sources to protect it against foreign agents. The antibody that a fetus receives from its mother through the placenta during pregnancy is an example of passive immunity. Likewise, during the initial days of lactation, mother's milk contains a yellowish fluid called colostrum that has copious amounts of the antibody IgA. Therefore, mother's milk also provides passive immunity to babies. Did you know that even though passive immunity provides immediate protection to the body against pathogens, the body doesn't develop any memory of the pathogen. This means that the body is at risk of being attacked by the same pathogen when infected by it later. Therefore, immunity can be innate or acquired. It can also be either active if induced by an infection or a microbial attack or passive if provided with ready-made antibodies. The immunity of the human body is based on memory. When the body encounters a pathogen for the first time, it reacts with a primary immune response and produces memory cells. When the body is attacked by the same pathogen twice, these memory cells offer an intensified secondary immune response. This memory of the immune system is also used as a principle in the immunization program. A preparation of antigenic proteins of pathogens or an inactive or weakened pathogen is introduced into the body as a vaccine. The antibodies produced in the body against these pathogens are then able to neutralize the pathogens during an actual infection. Vaccines generate memory, which enables B and T cells to recognize the pathogen quickly and produce an army of antibodies in response. Sometimes when a quick immune response is required, for instance during a tetanus infection where the body is infected with deadly microbes, preformed antibodies are injected into the body. It's the same with snake bites, where patients are injected with preformed antibodies or an antitoxin, which is a preparation of antibodies against the snake venom. This type of immunization involving preformed antibodies is called passive immunization. New technologies like recombinant DNA technology have made the large-scale production of antigenic polypeptides of pathogens from yeast or bacteria possible. The hepatitis B vaccine is produced in a similar manner from yeast. In higher vertebrates, like human beings, memory-based acquired immunity is so evolved that they can differentiate foreign organisms such as pathogens from self cells. Most experimental immunology is based on this aspect. In addition, sometimes due to genetic or other unknown reasons, the body attacks itself or self cells. This attack damages the body and is called an autoimmune response. An example of an autoimmune disease is rheumatoid arthritis that affects the joints. Similarly, apart from an autoimmune response, the immune response also comes into play during an allergy. It is interesting to note that some particles in the environment such as pollen, dust and mites cause us to sneeze or wheeze for no apparent reason. 
This usually happens because people are allergic or sensitive to these particles. This exaggerated immune response to certain antigens in the environment is called an allergy. Whereas the substances to which such an immune response is produced are called allergens. Dust, pollen, animal dander and mites are some common allergens. The antibodies produced against these allergens are usually the IgE type. A runny nose, sneezing, watery eyes and difficulty breathing are common symptoms of allergic reactions. An allergic reaction is caused by the release of chemicals like histamine and serotonin from mast cells. Therefore, the use of drugs like antihistamine, adrenaline and steroids quickly reduces the symptoms of an allergy. To determine the exact cause of an allergy, the patient has to either be exposed to or injected with small doses of different allergens. The patient's reaction to each allergen is studied to arrive at a conclusion. Somehow, modern day lifestyles that border on unhealthy have lowered natural immunity and heightened our sensitivity to various allergens. Moreover, a protected early childhood doesn't prepare the human body for the vagaries of the environment in a metro city. Therefore, even though our environment is continually getting polluted and we are exposed to thousands of antigens every day, it is a combination of the body's immunity and a vaccination program based on immunization principles that help us combat infections and diseases. The human immune system works as an armor against infections and diseases. It helps the body distinguish between non-self cells like bacterial, fungal and viral pathogens from self cells. The immune system responds to non-self agents and remembers them. It also plays an important role in reacting to allergens, organ transplantation as well as autoimmune responses. The human immune system consists of lymphoid organs, lymph nodes and lymph cells called lymphocytes. The lymphoid organs are where lymphocytes originate, mature and proliferate. Lymphoid organs can be classified as primary lymphoid organs and secondary lymphoid organs. Bone marrow and the thymus are two primary lymphoid organs. Bone marrow is a flexible tissue found in the hollow interior of bones where all blood cells, including lymphocytes, are produced. The thymus, on the other hand, is a lobed organ which is located near the heart and beneath the breastbone. The thymus, which is quite large at birth, shrinks in size with an increase in age. By the time a person reaches puberty, the thymus shrinks considerably. Both bone marrow and the thymus provide the environment for the development and maturation of T lymphocytes. It is in these two organs that immature lymphocytes differentiate into antigen sensitive lymphocytes. When lymphocytes mature, they move to the secondary lymphoid organs such as the spleen, lymph nodes, tonsils, Bears patches in the small intestine and appendix. It is inside the secondary lymphoid organs that lymphocytes interact with antigens and proliferate to form effector cells. 
The spleen is a large bean-shaped organ located in the upper left part of the abdomen, protected by the rib cage. It chiefly contains lymphocytes, erythrocytes and phagocytes. It acts as a large reservoir of blood to be supplied in times of emergencies like hemorrhagic shock or excess loss of blood due to cuts or injuries. It also plays the role of an RBC graveyard by removing old or damaged RBCs from the body. Apart from the lymphoid organs, the human body has clusters of lymph nodes in places such as the neck, underneath the arms and in the groin. Lymph nodes trap microbes and antigens that enter lymph and tissue fluid. It is these antigens trapped inside the lymph nodes that activate the lymphocytes to produce antibodies resulting in an immune response. Another lymphoid tissue called mucosal associated lymphoid tissue or MALT is located inside the epithelial lining of major tracts like the respiratory, digestive and urogenital tracts. The T cells, B cells and macrophages present in MALT help regulate mucosal immunity. Malt constitutes about 50% of lymphoid tissue inside the body. Therefore, the immune system, which collectively comprises the lymphoid organs, lymph nodes and tissues, protects the human body from invasion by pathogens and microbes.